At this time, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. He hasn't been here for, it's been several years since you've been here. He lives down in the, almost the community of East Bend, right across from the power plant. And he's a member of Big Boom Baptist Church, but he's a friend of Bellevue's. And we'd like to introduce him this time at Brother Doug Black. Come and share with us what the Lord has laid on your heart. And we're so glad to have you today. I uh, assume I'm not in the top 10 that uh, they will call me at 930 on Monday and Sunday night. Want to know if I would preach. So I, I guess I'm out of the top 10. I'm probably the last one could fight. So, uh, you know, I was thinking this morning, I, d I don't know if I, Barb Slagle said that I had preached here in the new church, but I can't remember. So, yeah, has it, how long goes, when, how long? Just been here? Ten years? Well, I've aged about ten years since then, so we're down to these. So, uh, I was telling Brother James I have been, during this COVID nonsense or whatever you want to call it, a lot of churches, I went all over. Galton County, Grant County, Owen County, everywhere preaching. Because uh, I guess some preacher was afraid to preach, I don't know, but I preached in this one particular church two Sundays in a row, and I was there the second Sunday. And, you know, a lot of these churches are kind of set up the same, you know. And I was sitting there, and Sunday school was letting out, and people was coming out kind of the same way you all facility is here. And, uh, the lady come out with her, looked like five, six, seven-year-old boy, son. And they got to right there, and he looked at me, and he looked at his mom, and he said, Mom, that one guy's back. <laughs> so uh, I guess I could say that here in Bellevue. I'm, that guy's back one more time. But uh, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And uh, if I can give you any advice on seeking a pastor because i see this a lot don't get ahead of god don't grab somebody just for the sake of filling this pulpit but don't run behind him stay in touch with him pray about it because there's nothing a lot of churches that i go to and maybe this is the reason that i'm here today i don't know but a lot of churches i go to throughout our community and throughout Kentucky, I hear this, that was a mistake. Talking about pastors and youth ministers, we didn't realize until we got him this or that. So, so you just, you, uh, you, you bathe the people in prayer. You know, I was thinking on the way down here this morning, uh, remember what a lot of you all We'll remember this. Remember the old pulpit committee days when they would select a group of people? I'll just give you some of you. Some of you all know what I'm talking about, but they would, the church would select a group of people and you would go to a church. And I remember my mom and dad, when we was kids growing up in Big Bow, mom and dad would say, there's a pulpit committee here. You could see them a mile away and they would come and they would listen to your pastor. And then they would make him an offer. Would you come to our church? You know, the, those days are long gone. And a lot of times we just get in a big hurry about getting someone to fill a position when God has a plan and we kindly don't go with God's plan. So uh, just, just don't lag behind, but don't run ahead of God. Um. I kind of struggled about what to preach about because I was at a church here a couple weeks, a month or so ago, and they called me after the first service, and they called me that evening at home and said, don't worry about coming back next Sunday. And you know, that's kind of a kick in the gut when you try to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and people said, we don't want to hear that. That's basically what they told me. They pinned me down about the King James Version. 
We are King James Version only. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but today you didn't tell me that. So, but I, I'm, I just kind of had a hard time this week for the, since I talked to Dale about what to preach. But this is what the message that I feel like that God has laid on my heart. Because I believe with all my heart that in the name of evangelism and winning the lost, that we have duped multitudes and multitudes of people into thinking they're on their way to heaven when in fact they are far from God. We have watered down the gospel of Jesus Christ into this nice little sip of cherry Kool-Aid that tastes real good. And I think it's time that we get away from this Western world watered down gospel that promises us everything and costs us absolutely nothing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse thir- starting in verse th- 13, he said, Enter in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many, many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Do you hear the difference? Many and few. He goes on and says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree, now listen to this, bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire therefore by their fruits you shall know them and then the last three verses jesus is talking to the people this is not Matthew, this is not Mark, this is not Luke, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He said, Many, many will say to me on that day, judgment day, Lord, Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons? And did we not do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. Period. That is far away from what we have been promoting. What is genuine salvation what is the new birth jesus said verily verily i say unto you ye must be born again that word must means shall you shall be born again so what is genuine salvation what does that look like is it coming here on sunday Is it being baptized? Is it being involved in all kinds of church activities? Is it being your name, being on the membership role of the church? Is it being a good person, doing good things, doing good deeds? What is is genuine salvation? And I think there's five questions that we have to answer today in order to figure this out. Because I think a lot of people across our land has has answered completely wrong. Completely wrong. You don't have to answer these questions out loud. Maybe if you want to just write them down and go home this afternoon and look at them. But this is something that God has laid on my heart. You see, these are my notes. I had people at church say, different churches say this. Now, we have a PowerPoint presentation. We, you know, I said, uh, no, that uh, me and that stuff doesn't jive. 
So this is what God has laid on my heart. The first question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Has there ever been a time in your life that you truly repented of your sins? That you came before God broken over your sinful, lost condition? Lord, everything that you, that you show me in my life, I give up for you today. Everything that you show me in the future in my life that is sin, God, I give that up for you today. Have you ever came to the point where you were broken over your sin? You see, I think we have a terrible, terrible viewpoint of sin. God is holy and God is just, and He will not tolerate my sin and He will not tolerate your sin. We have to get to the point of brokenness and repentance over our sin. God, look what my sin has done to my life. Look what it's done to you. Look what it's done to your reputation. Look what it's done to my family. And look what it's doing to me. Someone said repentance is the funnel through which all God's mercy flows. One of our greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln, he said, God will not move on us until we are on our faces before him coming clean. Abraham Lincoln said that hundreds of years ago. God will not move on us until we are on our faces before him coming clean. Jesus told the religious people in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, they was all squabbling about all these traditions, and the Pharisees and all those people were saying, you know, these people are not doing this right. And you know what Jesus said? He looked at him and he said this, he said, unless you repent, you all likewise perish. So don't be worrying about tradition to what everybody else, he told the religious leaders that day, he said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish perish the very first sermon that jesus came preaching in mark chapter one he said this jesus speaking he said the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe the gospel now my question to you is this will a prayer get you to heaven dear god dear god to repeat this prayer after me how many times have we heard this Dear God, dear God, save me, save me. I know I'm a sinner. I'm a no, I'm a sinner. Thank you, thank you. Come into my life, change my life. And we never see him again. A man or a woman, a boy or a girl, at the age of accountability, they must realize that they are lost before they can be saved. Amen? And God's Holy Spirit has to begin to work and to draw that person to them. It's not in some kind of a prayer. There is no magical prayer in this Bible. We hear this thing called the sinner's prayer. I don't know whoever came up with that. But Jesus said, first off, we need to repent. And I think we have liked to shove that one kindly off to the side. And we like this. Lord, forgive me. Come into my life. Thank you. Now I'm going to go on vacation. Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's what we have come to here in the United States of America. Question number two. Have you placed your complete confidence and faith in Jesus Christ and Him and Him only for your forgiveness and your salvation? This is where I hear all kinds of things in different churches. I sat in a church a couple years ago, and they was giving testimony. And I was supposed to speak after that. And I was amazed at the people that stood up and said, I've been a member of this church for 73 years. And I've enjoyed every bit of it. That was their testimony. And as bad as I hate to say this, but as true as it is, I never heard one person during that time say, I was lost. 
I was 22, 23 years old. I was lost and on my way to hell, and I came to know Jesus Christ, and he changed my life. I never heard anything like that. It was all about what I have done. I've taught Sunday school for 63 years. The men sing your Sunday school class. And I'm so proud of that. Is that salvation? Is that what true salvation is? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are we saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how would we know if we did enough? If we worked our way to heaven, how would we know that we have done enough? Wouldn't that be something if we were sitting here today and all of a sudden James jumps up off the front row, God said, I just did enough. I made it. Sorry, but I'm going. And we'd be like, well, how much more do I got to do? You know, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm teaching. I'm singing. I'm playing instruments. I'm doing things like that. And maybe the next Sunday, someone else jumps up and said, I made it. I did enough. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. All of your doing has accomplished nothing. Nothing. God is more concerned Jesus is more concerned about your ever-living, never-dying soul than what he is about you being sitting here in one of these seats to the sun. He is more concerned about you coming to know him than all the works that you can do here in this church. I want you to think with me. I want you to just go on a little trip with me. Some of you all will know this. The vast majority of you probably won't. A few of you will. You know where... Kentucky 16 coming out of Walt, the Walton Nicholson area. You know where that is? Okay, just travel down through there with me. You come to the intersection of 16, I think, is it 16 or 14? 16. Yeah. You come to the intersection of 16 and US 25. Walton is to the south of you. Richwood is to the north of you. You know what I'm talking about? There's a stoplight there now. Used to be just stop sign. When you pulled up there and you was looking at 25, remember the old barn that used to set right in front of there? Does anybody remember what that said on that bar? Do you? Yeah, that's what it said. It said, all paths lead to God, choose one. It said that for years. And I remember pulling up there thinking, that's not true. Who put this on here? That since then, that barn is gone. But see, we live in a day and an age where we we like to hear that. Oh, good. All paths lead to God. Well, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm going to heaven. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a Catholic. Whatever it may be. But all paths do not lead to God. Only the only path that leads to God is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Period. All paths do not lead to God. You can search this Bible from cover to cover, and there is nothing where Jesus said anything about being a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Pentecostal, a Catholic, or anything like that. He said to come to Him. And all paths go through Jesus Christ. All of our working and all of our trying will not get you one step closer to heaven. You say, well, Doug, you know, I've been baptized. Well, let me ask you this, and we're not going to get into this, but I just want to ask you this. What about the thief on the cross? Remember what? Remember him? He had nothing at all to offer God. He was condemned to die, hanging there beside the Savior. And the only thing that he could say was, remember me when you enter into your kingdom? And Jesus said, yeah, right. What have you got to offer? That's not what he said. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
He didn't say, I would, but buddy, it's going to be impossible for, impossible for me to baptize you because I'm hanging on this cross and you're hanging on that one, and we're just not going to be able to get this done. But having said that, baptism, in my opinion, is an absolute must if you have truly been born again. Because it is picturing, it is showing a picture to this world that I am identifying with Christ. The old man is buried and separated and separate from the new man, and there is a new life and a new creation. So, baptism won't get you there. Being a church member won't get you there. Doing all kinds of things won't get you there. The third question is this. Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ as Master and Lord of your life? See, we don't like that word, surrender. Oh, my goodness. Surrender. You know, I grew up in a house, and I'm sure many of you all did as well, that we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, training union, discipleship training, everything you can imagine. If they mowed the grass, we had to go. If they, it, it, that's just the way it was. But I, as I, the older I got, my mom and dad didn't really have a whole lot to offer as far as finances and money and things like that, but they were surrendered to Jesus Christ, whether it was mowing the grass at church, whether it was fixing a meal. You know, with this word surrender, we like, oh my goodness, I got to give up everything. That's not what surrender is. Surrendering is just being willing to do what God asked us to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Jesus, I will love you. Jesus, I will serve you. Jesus, I will obey you all of my days. With every cell that I have in my body, with every breath that I have, I will do my best to live for you, to love you, to serve you. The old time preachers preach these three things, repentance, conversion, and faithful to the end. To the end. Remember that old song? I'm sure you all sung it here. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I still will follow the cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. How are we doing so far? You didn't know you was going to get a member of the old pop quizzes at school. Be like, oh, man. She going to do what? Have you experienced the forgiveness and cleansing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Titus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us, Jesus saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You remember what it's really like to get like really, really clean? When your eye was out yesterday cutting wood, and, you know, you start out, it's hot, and then it got colder through the day. And, and uh, I got home, and I thought, man, I'm going to just take me a good hot shower. So I got in there, and I took, got all cleaned up, and it felt so good. I went in, I sat down in my old easy boy chair for a little while. Because the older you get, cutting wood is not really fun anymore. It's like a, a burden. It used to be it was fun, you know, to cut down a big tree and, things like that now so it's like I just gotta get some wood cut but you know it's it I, I thought back as I sat there and you know you have this body spray now you know you can put all this stuff on you and uh I was sitting there and I was I was thinking when we was kids growing up 
and mom would sit and us, get in that bathtub. Back then, we didn't have a shower. We had a bathtub. Probably the vast majority, nobody takes a bath anymore. It's all a shower. But I remember nine, ten years old, we'd go in there. And I mean, a lot of times I like wouldn't even sit down. You know, I'd just kind of throw the... And I'd come back out. And mom and dad, we'd be there in the living room. I'd come out and mom would say, get over here. Let me see you. You ever had that done? And they'd look behind your arms. Get back in there and clean yourself up. And you know, I thought about, you remember the day when you came to Christ and though your sins were a scarlet and you turned your life over to him and you asked him to come into your heart and you surrendered your life to him and you felt that embrace of forgiveness and mercy. Has anybody ever experienced that? I have. I was the biggest hypocrite going, my friends. I could put on the best show you ever wanted to see. And then on my knees about 20 plus years ago, I said, God, I am sick of this. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of going to church and sitting in Sunday school because that's just what I got to do and my life was a mess. And in the deepest part of my heart, I experienced that forgiveness and that mercy and that grace of God. Isaiah chapter 1 verses, verse 18 says, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. I went deer hunting a couple Saturdays ago. Remember when it snowed? And uh, I was sitting there in my tree stand. And uh, I was... After actually, I had seen a big buck. I'll be honest with you, and I was wanting to shoot that thing, but he never showed up. But I sat there in that tree stand, and I watched that snow come down, and I watched it just slowly but surely blanket that hillside that I was on. And this verse came to my mind, and I thought, wouldn't that be something if God would just do that in the United States of America, one more time? that we would just fall on our knees before him and experience a refreshing, and if you would want to call it a bath or a shower of his forgiveness and mercy. He said, though it be red like crimson, your sin shall be as wool. The very last question is this. At this very moment, are you at peace with God? You know, I remember as a kid getting in trouble and mom saying, go back there and get in your room. And when your dad comes home, the judgment day is coming. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after this to judge. And I can remember sitting there in my room thinking, oh, man. And I can remember my dad and them carpooled. They worked at Williamson Heating and Air Conditioning. And I remember Ralph Gilbert would drive some days and Orville Jones would drive some days. And I can remember the car pulling up and my dad getting out. And he would shut the door and he would say, I'll see you in the morning, Ralph or Orville, whoever was driving. Back though, back in those days, people took their lunch. My dad had that old metal lunch box and that old thermos, and I would see him walk into the house. And he would walk in, and I would be back there in my rooms, and Mom would, you know, he would say, how, how are you doing, blah, 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 and this and that. And then Mom would say, your youngest son's back there in the bedroom. And this is what he did. And it seemed like those steps I could hear coming down that hall. It was just like linoleum. It would be like, I'd be like, oh, man. But you see, I wasn't at peace with my dad because I knew what I had done. 
Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this, Therefore, having been justified. That word justified means just as if I had never sinned. That God sees me clean, righteous, and holy. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. At this very minute, the Bible says that God's Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Did you catch that? God's Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit inside in the deepest part of my heart, in my soul. The Spirit Himself, God's Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. God. Are you confident in that this morning? That you are a child of God? I say this with all gentleness, but I say this out of love, that if Jesus Christ has not or is not changing your life, as we speak, I think you better check up on your salvation. I say this with love and with tenderness, that God is more concerned about your relationship with Him than all of your works that you may be doing here or outside of this church. And maybe you say, I come to church, and after all, look, Doug, I'm taking notes today. How's that sound? And maybe you identify yourself as a Christian. Maybe you identify that you are a Christian. Maybe you hang around with Christian people. Maybe you listen to Christian music. Maybe you have a Bible that's got your name engraved in the corner of it. And maybe you've got all these reasons that you are a Christian. But I want to tell you this right now. If you have no desire for God whatsoever, if this is all you have is for 45 minutes to an hour on Sunday and the rest of the week God means absolutely nothing to you, you have no desire to come under God's Word, and what that means is you have no desire to live the way that this book requires us to live, and you have no desire to rid yourself of sin and no desire to live a pure and holy life before God, You have no thirst. You have no hunger for righteousness. You don't communicate with God. You don't pray. You have no prayer life. Then quite possibly, you have only admitted that you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I was thinking this week, if we all packed up today and we went down to Danny and Sandra Cup's farm, Danny's a farmer, says he's a farmer. So we're all going to go down there and we're going to journey their farm. And we walk down there, we get on the church bus or however we want to get there, we go down there and we say, Danny, you're a farmer, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You got any cows? No, no. Been thinking about getting some, though, but I haven't gotten none yet. But Danny, you got any tractors? Uh, no. Plan on getting a couple of them, too, here for too long. But yeah, yeah, I'm a farmer. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, sure am. Boy. Danny, show me show me some. Do you raise it? Corn? No, don't have any corn. Don't have anything like no. But, but yeah, I'm planning on doing all that. And see, that's what, you know, that may be a stupid example, but that's what a lot of people are in God's sights. They're almost there. You know what I'm saying? Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, I'm planning on it. One of these days, yeah, I'm planning on it. I'm planning on it. You know, and they go to bed haunted Sunday after sun, Sunday night after Sunday night after Sunday night because they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They have no desire to follow Him. Sin is running rampant in their lives, and they come back to church on the next Sunday just to do it over again and again and again. And maybe you're kind of like uh, the one person that I was talking to here a while back. His testimony was this. 
he said his mom and dad come up to him. He was about nine or ten years old. And they said, I'll just use the name Junior. They said, Junior, do you want to go to heaven with mommy and daddy when you die, when you die or do you want to go and die and burn in hell? And he said, I, no, I want to go to heaven. They said, well, you're going forward next Sunday after church and you're going to get saved. He said, okay. So that Sunday came. Mom and dad took him down the aisle. He was about nine years old. And about 50 years later, he realized that he was as lost as a goose. Because you know what he did? He was scared to death of dying and going to hell. And mommy and daddy drug him down the aisle. And he said that he got saved enough. He said his testimony to me was this. He said, Doug, I had nothing. He said, I was on the church roll. I was baptized. And he said, I had nothing. And maybe you've prayed a prayer. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've signed the back of a piece of paper, but you have nothing. The extent of our relationship with Jesus Christ is all about obedience. Henry Blackaby said in his book, he said, the extent of Jesus Christ is this. If he ever speaks to you, what you do next reveals what you really believe about God. If God ever speaks to you, what you do next reveals what you really believe about God. Is Jesus Christ changing your life? We're going to close with this. Can you look back week ago, six months ago, year ago? Can you look back and say, God, I am taking steps forward. God, you are changing my life. God's sin does affect me now. You are changing my life. I am taking steps forward. Sir, can your wife look at you and say, he's not the husband that he used to be? Ma'am, can, can, can you look at her, at her? Can he look at you and say, she's not the wife that she used to be? You see, we don't get all of this in one big slam dunk. Christianity is a daily walking relationship. Jesus is changing me minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. I don't have the desire to go to places I used to go. I don't have the desire to look at the things I used to, to look at. I am being changed day by day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Apostle Paul said, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Is that true in your life? Are you the old creature? Are you a new creature? You see, I believe there's a great big gap between what people really believe, what people profess, and what is really true in their lives. Billy Graham said that he was convinced that half of our church roles in the United States, people in the church roles were lost. Half. You see, it's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. The Bible says that the demons believe and tremble. Anybody would say, say today that there'll be demons in heaven? No. James chapter 2, verse 19, it says the demons believe and tremble. Would you agree with me today that they're not that the demons are not saved and not on their way to heaven, but they believe? You see, sometimes when I think we say I believe, I think what we really mean is this. I hope, I think, I'm sincere, I'm trying. But when you look in the mirror, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see a church member? Or do you see someone that is being changed day by day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says this. The Apostle Paul says, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. He said, Exam he's telling the people of Corinth that. And maybe that's what God wants here today. He says, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. He said, do you not know this about yourself, that Jesus Christ lives in you? 
He said, do you not know this? He said, lest indeed you fail the test. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Do you not know this about yourself, that Jesus Christ lives in you, lest indeed you fail the test? Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't be going by what mom said or dad said or this one said or that one said. Paul said you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I just, don't tune me out, please. I didn't, Dale Scott asked me to come, take it up with him. This, if you don't hear anything else, I want you to understand this this morning. This is the only life that you and I will ever live. This is it. You get one shot at this. This is it. This is it. This is the only eternity that you and I will ever, ever know. This is it. You don't get third and fourth chances. Don't get this wrong. Don't get this wrong. Don't be walking off into eternity with some vague, foggy notion about your salvation. Don't be on hope so. Don't be trusting in sincerity. Don't be trusting in church membership. Don't be church trusting in that you sang in the choir, you did this or you did this. God wrote a book and it's called the Bible. And in that book is the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and on the third day, He rose again. That's the Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you died today, as I look out across this congregation, there's probably people here that will see Jesus face to face in the not too distant future. You say, well, Doug, that's not nice to say. But you know something? That's just reality. That's just reality. I about almost didn't make it yesterday. Or made it here today because something that happened yesterday. I was cutting wood. Didn't think nothing about it. You'll think this is stupid, but it about killed me. I had a pair of gloves on. I don't wear gloves that often. But I was up in the back of my truck and I was... I still split the wood with the old mole and I was tired so I just sewed the last four or five big pieces up in the bed of the truck and I got home was unloading it and I got down to those last three or four pieces and I was up in that truck and I picked up that big piece of locust about this big and it had a little limb sticking off the side of it and I had it like this and I went like that and that limb caught that glove and it jerked me out of that truck and I fell on my head over the bank and there I was with this piece of wood in my glove you say well you big sissy but the point I was trying to make is this I just was down to two or three pieces and you know the Bible says that no man knows what a day shall bring forth and little did I know I did it didn't I shouldn't say I flew out I stumbled and fell out of the truck but you see, we don't know what tomorrow holds. I preached more funerals in the last couple years than I ever had. People calling me, so and so died. They they died from the COVID. Can you, can you? And and it was sad. As I met with those families, and I'll be honest with you, few, several of them had no relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew a lot of them all my life. And as the families would try to tell me, he didn't go to church, but he was a believer. That's what that was their hope. He he never did really like being in church and stuff, but 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 he believed. It's more than that, my friends, right? It's more than just saying I believe. If you stood before him today and he would ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What would you say? What would you say? 
Because the only thing that would suffice is, God, you should. I haven't done nothing for you to let me in except that I repented of my sins. I put my faith and trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, for my salvation and forgiveness, and you changed my life. That's the only answer that will suffice. In Lubbock, in the Lubbock Cathedral in Germany, I've never been there, but I've read a lot about it. When you walk into that church, right on the wall, it says this. It was written in uh, 1173 A.D. And it says this. You call me master, and you obey me not. You call me light, and you see me not. You call me the way and you follow me not. You call me life and you desire me not. You call me fair and you love me not. You call me wise and you acknowledge me not. You call me rich and you ask me not. You call me eternal and you seek me not. You call me gracious and you trust me not. You call me Savior and you praise me not. You call me noble and you serve me not. You call me mighty and you honor me not. You call me just and you fear me not. And then the very last verse says, When I condemn thee, when I condemn thee, blame me not. And I think that's where many of us stand this very day in this very age. Jesus said these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I don't know where the Lord finds you at this morning. Maybe you're in the position that this old boy found himself in. It says a man died and found himself standing in front of the gates of heaven. Simon Peter said, Okay, this is how this works. I don't know how we ever come up with Simon Peter at the gate. I don't know. But Simon Peter says, this is how it works. It takes a thousand points for you to get in. So tell me all the good things that you've done in your life. And the man said, well, I was married for 61 years. I was faithful to my wife. I stuck it out with her through thick and thin until death did us part. He said, I worked hard. I was a good provider for my family. I was a good husband. I was a good dad. Simon Peter looked at him and said, well, that's good. That's worth two points. He said, two points, and I need a thousand? I was married to that lady for 61 years, and it's worth two points? That's all I get? I was a good dad. I worked. I got up and I went to work all those years, and I get two points out of this? Simon Peter said, go on. He said, what else? He said, well, I attended church faithfully. I worked in Bible school. I taught Sunday school for many years. I took up the offering. I helped mow the grass. I sang in the choir. I helped pack boxes for Operation Christmas Child. I attended services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I did a lot of things around the church. And he looked at Simon Peter, waiting, and he said, two points. And then he went off again, carried on about all the thing that he did. And then he said, go on. He said, I never drank. I never took drugs. I never drove fast. I never stole anything. I was always honest. I never cheated on my taxes. I did the best I could do to live a good life. I was good to people. I helped people that was in need. And Simon Peter said, two points. Finally, the man fell on his face and he put his hands in his face and he said, only by the grace of God am I going to be, be able to make it into heaven. And Simon Peter said, well done. That's worth a thousand points. Now we know that that is not true. But the point is this. I think that's where a lot of people are at. God, I'm trying. Man, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And I'm doing it. But the question is this, can you look back, maybe there's people here that's only been saved a year, can you look back and say, man, I'm, 
I'm growing. God is changing my life. Maybe you've been saved for 30 years. Can you honestly say, Jesus Christ, you are changing my life? Because if you can't, I would highly suggest that you check up on what your faith is in this morning. I have no idea what time it is. I really don't care. I don't have a watch. But this is what I want. I want to leave out of here knowing that I did what God wanted me to do. And if there's someone here that today that doesn't know you, as, doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're going to have invitation time. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not really crazy about that stuff. I don't want to try to talk you into nothing. I want God's Holy Spirit to, to, to stir you and to draw you, and I want you to see your need for Jesus Christ. I don't really think too much about these sinners' prayers and things like that. There is a prayer of repentance, don't get me wrong. But I want God to do His work. And I don't know where the Lord finds you at today, but I pray that He will meet you and He will meet us at the greatest need in our life today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that one of these days I will stand before you and I will give an account for every time that I stood in this pulpit, stood in a pulpit, and for everything that I have ever said and ever done. And I pray, Lord, today that you would be glorified. I pray that you would be lifted up. You said that if you'd be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto you, Lord, and I ask and pray today that you would do that. I pray that for someone here today that you would just bring them to repentance. I pray that you would bring them to a salvation experience with you that only you can bring about. And for those of us who do know you, Lord, help us, Lord, to be the light. Help us, Lord, to be the people that shines in this dark world. And these things I ask in your name. Amen.